Thank you so much, uh, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a talk. And actually, my original plan was, as said in the title, to talk about critical half-wave problems, which would mean two, uh, the L2 critical problem that Patrick Girard was talking about on Monday, and another new problem, which I will now try to focus on, because Patrick did such a great job, it's hard to really add something to this. So let me, let me, let me explain what I want to discuss, is what I phrase as a half-wave maps problem. Okay, so what's that? So it's an equation that is e extremely easy to write down. So let's see. And um, I will say a few words in a moment. So the wedge means the cross product in R3. And u is our unknown function, depending on time, on an interval, say from 0 to capital T. And say it's defined on rd with values in S2, which we always, of course, think being embedded in R3. Yeah, so this is a, it's a quite, I mean, simple-minded, at first glance, generalization of a Schrödinger maps problem. Yeah, so you just take the, say, landau lifshitz equation, uh, where this would be the Laplacian, or it would be minus the Laplacian, but minus signs can be easily, so to say, absorbed by redefining direction of time. This is an Hamiltonian equation, by the way, as so I will show to you soon. So uh, I might get some various sign mistakes in my formulas, but they don't matter. So that's what I want to... Only where it matters, I think I have them right. So let's see. Okay, so this is the half wave maps equation. And so there are two reasons why I s recently started to work on that. First of all, I've seen this equation before, but so only recently I realized that this has a really somewhat very nice physical interpretation. That's the one bonus thing about it, which I try to make uh, somewhat clear to you here. And the second thing is, which I was always also afraid about, is that you cannot do much with that. That is rather quite unexplicit what you can do compared to what like Schrodinger maps or wave maps equation, where you have a nice explicit structure, say, of uh, equivariant uh, wave maps and so on, it studies stability and blow up problems like that. But it turns out to be wrong, this statement that I will show to you that you can do a lot of it explicitly because I will, as my main uh, result today, discuss that in the one dimensional case, which is the energy critical case, I will show to you how to completely classify all traveling solitary wave solutions in an explicit form in terms of so-called Blaschke products. Okay, so this is something I uh, recently found and uh, something that amazed me and gives me hope to continue this study of this energy critical problem. Okay, so as I said, this is an Hamiltonian equation. So there's an energy functional attached to it, which of course looks like this. somewhat guess what this is going to be. So maybe there's a half here if you like that. And for later purposes, I will just all do this here for record that this is of course expressible as a double integral, which will, as you see, make a connection to a very interesting physical application of this model. And uh, the Poisson bracket attached to that, so that you can see that you can write this equation of, as a Hamiltonian equation of motion, is the one that is given by functions with values in uh, S2. Say the components at x and y satisfy a Poisson bracket structure, which is given by this expression. So this is the anti-symmetric Levi-Civita symbol and uh, the delta function. So if you, if you use this structure, at least formally, you see that the half wave maps equation is formally equivalent to this evolution equation given by the Poisson bracket given with H, okay? So in particular, H is at least a formally conserved quantity. So let me 
now start and discuss the motivation behind this equation. So, first of all, and is it clear now that you get the original equation? Ah, yeah. If you are yeah, clear, I mean, you have to plug in what this Poisson structure is, and uh, you work out what this is by plugging this in, and then you finally see that this is the equation that you get. I mean, if you take, for instance. Here, the Dirichlet integral, you get the landau lifshitz equation with that Poisson structure. The Poisson structure is some universal thing. It's just the energy functional that determines whether you have the half-wave MAPS equation, as I call it, or the landau lifshitz well, equation. Is, what is the landau lifshitz equation? Uh, the landau lifshitz e is the Schrödinger MAPS equation. Oh, okay. uh, I don't have to write it down. <laughs> yeah, Schrödinger MAP or landau lifshitz uh, coming from physics, like the continuous version of the Heisenberg equation for a ferromagnetic system. Okay. Yeah, so d equal to 1, by the way, would correspond to the energy critical case. Everything above d equal to 2 and higher is, of course, an energy subcritical, a uh, supercritical, sorry, by the way. And the energy critical case is also physically most relevant, as I will explain in a second. And there's also another thing attached to it. It has a conformal invariance property. Okay. So this is the case I will focus on. Okay. So the motivation, so one motivation, comes from differential geometry. I mean, recently, there was some growing interest in what is called a half harmonic map. With target S2, OK? So that would correspond, of course, obviously, to static solutions to my flow equation. Huh? So, in particular, these static solutions will play also an important role for this time-dependent equation. Of course, you might also think about something like a half-harmonic map heat flow, which would be a parabolic analog to this equation, which I don't discuss here. So, this is something that was recently introduced by Rivière and uh, Dalio. Um, in particular, the uh, regularity theory for these equations, like, uh, say, if you are in the critical dimension that an H1 half map is actually a smooth map, like an analog of Elan's uh, regularity theory for uh, um, harmonic maps in two dimensions. Yeah? But it's a different thing because uh, Riviere used some kind of commutator type arguments to get this regularity result, and also from a more geometric point of view, in a very recent work by Fraser and Shane, it is seen that this equation corresponds to a free boundary minimal disk problem. I will come to this later. That is to say, it is also naturally connected that you look for something which is a minimal surface, say inside the ball, the unit ball, with a certain condition how the boundary of this minimal surface uh, hits the boundary of the ball, which is S2, and in, a, in this setting it has to hit perpendicular, and you can actually see that this problem is equivalent to this, to study the free boundary minimal disk. Yes, this is a boundary equation. I will come to this point where you see that it's a completely natural connection to the theory of minimal surfaces. Okay, I come to this. And B, this is the physical motivation behind that. Of course, I will later look for traveling solitary waves, which will be generalizing these half harmonic maps in the, in the sense that there is another non-zero right-hand side. Okay, and I will classify also all these solutions. And B is uh, physics, and this is 
typical thing, you have to know the right names to look for, because physicists like these names. You see weak ordering, Gibbs state, if you don't know what who weak was, who Gibbs was, <laughs> it's hard, hard to find out in the literature what this is about. Once you have the right code words, <laughs> it works. So the first two names that somewhat play a role in this business are Haldane and Shastri, two physicists, who wrote down a Hamiltonian for a spin chain, and I will be a little bit formal here of course, which is some object like that. Okay, these are spin operators, I won't go into any details. And uh, there is a, so to say, interaction among spins. This is on a discrete lattice, say, in one dimension. So you have fixed lattice sites, and xk, xk plus one, and so forth, are the lattice sites. And to each lattice site, you attach a quantum spin. I, I don't want it to get go into details what this is about, and they interact with certain what's called long-range potentials. Huh? That might be a sine squared of the difference of the lattice sides, or there's also the, so to say, algebraic model where this is a square of this, and so on. There's a whole zoo of this, and the point about this, these are exactly solvable models in the sense you can calculate the spectrum and so forth, and you can also find lax pairs and so on. These are long-range quantum chains, which have a very uh, nice particular structure from the physical point of view. So it's hard to draw what these quantum operators do actually, but I installed Planck's constant here just to indicate that in a certain limiting regime, which you can think of the semi-classical limit, or also a large spin limit, you are at least formally led to what is called a system of classical spins. So then this Hamiltonian becomes something which you could phrase as a calogero moser type Hamiltonian with spin, which would look like this, that formally at least, the spin operators get replaced by something of this form, where the SKs are now unit vectors in three space. Okay, so in a classical regime, the spins are given by, a, by an arrow which lies on the unit sphere in three-dimensional space. That's a, at least for a physicist a typical procedure to go from a quantum spin system to a classical spin system. So if you just had just nearest neighbor interactions, so this wasn't this function, but just only nearest neighbors couple, you get the Heisenberg chain. And the continuum limit of the Heisenberg chain, in the sense that this parameter a shrinks to zero, would be the classical landau lipschitz schrodinger maps equation. However, here you can, of course, somewhat anticipate that in the next step of taking this limit, you get that this sum leads to a double integral of that form, that you have a continuous spin variable, which I call you know, s, which is of this form, and we are here on one space dimension. Making this rigorous makes it, of course, if one step is to study actually that the dynamics converge in a certain sense, and of course, in higher dimensions might be even more difficult in the critical case. I think it's still doable, but it's, it's, it's not so simple. And on account of the fact that this is of unit length, you can, of course, rewrite it as this. which is the Hamiltonian I wrote above in one space dimension, okay? Again, this calogero moser type uh, Hamiltonian also shares the magic property that you have lax pairs. You have, a, you have a very explicit structure here. And you might wonder if this survives actually for this limiting PDE. There is a strong indication for that because I will show to you an explicit classification of all solitary waves, it might be a hint that this is a completely integrable system, which is yet uh, energy critical. So it shows a criticality, which in principle can also say that you have finite time blow up and so on. So let's see. So now I come to the more 
But this would be just one dimension, right? So the, the problem would be super but I guess, in the dimension one. Yes, exactly. In, in uh, dimension two and larger, it's super critical. And in one dimension, it's energy critical. And in principle, you can think like for uh, energy critical Schrodinger maps, you have also blow up solutions. Yeah, that in this case, you might have, because of an integrable structure, too many conservation laws, which forbids such a thing. But it could also be like for the cubic Chigo equation, that they only live up to a certain level of regularity, and you still see some kind of uh, Sobolev-type growth phenomena, which are a little bit counterintuitive first, uh, if you think of a completely integrable, if I think of a completely integrable system. So what I'm here interested in is to consider the traveling solitary waves for this model. And this is interesting in one respect. First, that uh, for the lando lifshitz equation, such a thing does not exist in one dimension. Uh, there are only static finite energy solutions. You don't, cannot create um, uh, traveling solitary waves for the lando lifshitz equation. You might think you can apply a Galilean boost, but this is not working. The, it's not. But of course, for the wave maps equation, you can do a Lorentz boost to get a traveling <coughs> uh, wave map, if you wish. No? But here, this is not a, a Lorentz invariant system, so we cannot apply something. But you will see that we get a rather explicit way of constructing these things. And I'll show to you that this is the only way to get them. OK, so you make an ansatz course that you say I have a velocity given, a real number v, and you say I look for solutions of the form utx is equal to say some profile uv of x minus vt, and this is simple to see that this now satisfies an equation of this form. Okay, there's a minus here, but it's inessential. Okay? And I have to be a little bit more precise. What I mean here, I mean a solution which is an h dot one half going from the real line to the unit sphere. Okay? And there's a certain boundary condition at infinity. A fixed, say the south pole if you wish maybe. Huh? Okay. This is always understood implicitly. One thing which I will completely skip is that you might ask for a regularity theory for this equation. Of course, we want ultimately that any solution is a smooth solution because the arguments I will present you will in some way need this kind of uh, property. But I will completely skip this and just mention that joint work with my former postdoc Armin Chikora, uh, you get that this is smooth. Naturally, of course, it's, it's not obvious at all because the perturbation, so to say, that you add is also a first order operator and it's, it's a massive, so to say, change of the equation. We know already smoothness for the v is equal to zero case, okay? But let's leave this issue aside for a moment. So, what you can do first is, of course, you can try to cook up a solution, okay? How could you maybe try to do that? First, there's one way, of course, you can think you check this variationally. This is critical points of the, at least formally, of the energy. And then you have to find another functional, which is a side condition, maybe it's such that the left-hand side comes from that side condition and V is a Lagrange multiplier, okay? call this functional p of u v constant, which in a sense would correspond to a linear momentum, but this is a tricky business in this set setting. I will not write down, you can in fact find a function, at least formally, so that you get this. The problem is, as you will see, is that both functionals uh, show a conformal invariance property and hence uh, 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 discussing, minimizing, say, sequences is not so simple. It's a little bit like the plateau problem. So uh, it might be a little bit painful to attack this problem variationally, but in principle, it should be doable, okay? One thing. 
So we won't follow this road. Second road is, of course, an implicit function theorem, at least for small v, you might be able to construct in the neighborhood of these, uh, whatever are the, the half harmonic maps, at least slow moving traveling waves, okay? But we won't do that. So there's a lucky punch here, which does the job, okay? At least you get solutions, you make an ansatz. So you start with a, a half harmonic map, which corresponds to a static solution. And you can find such things like just living, say, in the equ equator plane. Huh? So the third component is zero, of course, then. Uh, I have to make sure that this point also lies in that plane, but it's fine, okay? And now you make an ansatz that for uv, and that's sort of a magic thing here, but you will see a geometric reason for that later. Of course, I made a much more general ansatz first because I was thought, thought I was thinking about kind of mimicking Lorentz boosts. However, alpha and beta are just constants. And if and only if alpha, and that, that is not true, there's a, there's a sign. So if alpha is 1 minus v squared, so this, of course, assumes that v is less than unity, which means the solitary waves cannot propagate faster than the speed 1 in my units. Okay, but well, let's assume that for a moment. And b is equal to v you get a solution. That's it's quite fascinating <laughs> that you get an explicit cheap trick to construct, so to say, boosted solutions. So it's, uh, it's even... Is there any variance uh, in, in the equation that leads to this? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. There's no Lorentz invariance, there's no Galilean invariance. And the funny thing is also that this transform which comes from the static to a traveling one is just acting, so to say, from the outside, on the target. I mean, you don't have to do anything in the arguments of x. Well, x is just one value. Yeah, 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 but still, I mean, you could, I mean... Okay, let me draw a picture. The picture is this. Don't you have to adjust the boundary conditions? Huh? Okay, I change the boundary conditions, but I can rotate back. So I can always, uh, that's everything I say is modular rotation on the target. That's true. I, I violate the boundary condition, but I could rotate back. And then I would uh, get the same uh, boundary condition, but I, I, I'm gentle about that. So, so what I did is that this half harmonic map, and of course f and g are certain special functions, but it's, it's a certain kind of parameterization of the of a great circle, huh? gets, in a sense, boosted to some other circle, which lives here. And in the extreme case, when v, say, tends to 1, you just on the get a constant which just lives on the tip of the sphere. Okay. Okay, so the theorem that I'm going to talk about now says this is the only way to get the solutions, okay, the boosted solutions and gives an explicit characterization of all the possible functions f and g you can have here. So theorem. Shikoro. So let u, let v be a real number and u v This equation makes perfect sense if it's an h dot one half function in the distributional sense. Solve that. Then you have two cases. If v is bigger and modulus than one or equal to one, the only way 
is that you have a trivial solution. It's a constant, so it's nothing else can happen. And if V satisfies this, then what rotations, of course, are on the sphere, on the target, you have to have that uv of x is of that form, which I wrote down. And now what is f and g? A v, sorry, yes. where f <coughs> is the real part, say, of a function capital F, and g is the imaginary part, is the real part of a holomorphic function, in fact, on the boundary, living on the upper half plane, and on the boundary you get the little f, and g is the imaginary part of that function, and f is of the form f of z, is equal to what is called a finite Blaschke product. So there's a k running from 1 to, say, d, and there's uh, maybe a lambda k, z minus a k, there's a shift, of course, that is maybe possible, plus i, and these lambda k's are real numbers not zero, and the a case are arbitrary points in R, and uh, D is a uh, uh, natural number, of course. Okay. No, yes, for V equals zero, you can characterize that, the, but the point is, and this is the point, that you can really <coughs> reduce it to the case V is equal to zero. So I will explain that the proof is really uh, an advancement of understanding the case when v is equal to zero, okay? okay. But so can this be understood directly on the on stationary solution on the half harmonic map or unique? Okay. When I look at the stationary solution, the half harmonic maps, this is not completely easy to see, but doable, okay, with what's known in the literature in the recent literature, say. The point is that you can, so to say, also undo the boost transformation. I will explain that, okay? The so it, this would give you a characterization of all stationary solutions? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives you, in particular, characterization of all half harmonic maps, because it's a case v is equal to zero, okay? And there's, of course, A saying there is no traveling wave with speed larger than one, okay? This is also one point, huh? Okay, and the interesting fact is that the energy of these guys is of this form. There's a quantization, of course, involved, like for harmonic maps, the d, the index of the Blaschke product. However, by tuning the v, you can make this arbitrarily small. So it's like the ill too critical half-wave equation with Patrick Girard, where you have uh, L2 criticality, but you have s solitary waves which have arbitrarily small L2 mass, and now we have solitary waves with arbitrary small energy. Energy is now the critical thing. So it's completely different, say, from the Lando Lifshitz, where you have, don't have that, okay? Okay. All right, so I have roughly 20 minutes. What's that, true? 18. Okay, <laughs> 17, the clock counts. Okay, let me explain to you about the proof.
Okay. Okay, this is actually two statements, A and B. Okay, I will along say something about A, and, but I will of course focus on the more interesting part, B. So, what's the initial situation? So think first that we are given a solution, UV, and think it's smooth, okay, to avoid any issues here, so that the uh, image of course, it traces out a closed curve on the unit sphere, okay? And actually what we a posteriori see that these are just great circles or in the case when v is equal to zero or when v is not equal to zero, it's, it's a circle on the sphere, okay? But first, we don't know anything about this, more than this. So if you take, so we write for simplicity little u, is equal to uv. I, I want to skip that index little v because writing is a bit difficult. Okay, first thing of course that we do is also to see that you have a conformal invariance here is of course you consider this as a two-dimensional problem in a sense because this arises as a boundary of something. Yeah, so you take the u to be the harmonic extension. Okay. Of little u. That is capital U is a map from R2 plus, which you can also identify with a complex alpha half plane, into R3. It's a component-wise harmonic function. Um, yeah, And the boundary condition, star, is a boundary condition then because, as you know, it's a classical fact, that operator just becomes the uh, normal derivative with respect to this extension variable, huh? or minus the normal derivative. So effectively, you study the problem minus v of dx capital U, and there's a minus, so it will change here, but it's inessential, of dy. This is my new variable that I add to my space, like this, on the boundary. Okay. So far, so good. So by the maximum principle, <coughs> actually it's a strong maximum principle that inside it's strictly less than one. Well, y you see out that you, uh, the image of capital U is something inside the sphere, of course, because of this. And the boundary is, so to say, given by this little u, the boundary curve profile of the solitary wave. Okay, so far so good. Now <coughs> comes the first step that says, okay, capital U is a parametrization of a surface module and there might be branching points and these things, it's maybe not embedded, but we just say it's a minimal surface provides a minimal surface. That's the first step. So how to see that? The so first idea is to use something which is called a Hopf differential. So it's a function that you cook up depending on z, say. So z is just a notation, of course, for this. Yeah? And dz is the Wirtinger derivative. Uh, that's, uh, that's a fairly standard step, step here, what I do, but I just want to explain it. Uh, so I remember there should be maybe a four to have everything nice here. So now you take the derivative of capital U with respect to the Z. So it's actually just this, you combine them. So that's a C, uh, C three valued function. It's a three vector with complex entries and you t take the scalar product, not the Hermitian product. So you take this product. This is a standard thing in minimal surface theory. So what you get is this. Jesus, it's warm here. No nothing to do really with the questions. It's <laughs> the climate here. Okay. 
Okay, so the, the upshot is that this is a, because u is a harmonic function, this is a holomorphic function, okay? So you either check that dz bar, so the anti wertinger derivative <coughs> of this is zero. Hence, it's a holomorphic function. It's easy to see because d z bar times dz is just times a constant, the uh, Laplace operator. Okay, so far so good. And now comes the point that if you look at that function and you consider the imaginary part of this Hopf differential on the boundary. Okay, so then you use the boundary equation, okay? And now you have to explicitly work out what this means actually. It means in terms of real parts that you have this minus maybe 2i. I'm not 100% sure whether there's a plus or a minus, but it doesn't matter here. This, okay? So the imaginary part on the real axis of that holomorphic function in the upper half plane is the scalar product of dx u times uh, scalar product dy u. But now look at the equation here. This immediately tells you that at least when v is not equal to zero, this has to be perpendicular to that vector. Huh? And um, you see that the imaginary part of that holomorphic function on the real line is zero. Huh? You can extend it to the whole uh, complex plane, plane, the imaginary part, by odd reflection. However, the imaginary part of phi, because on the boundary it's h1 half, so this is actually an h dot 1 function, so this is this times this is an L1 function. It's integrable. Huh? So then you can easily conclude that the imaginary part is, a cons is identically zero. Okay, so because it's a holomorphic function, the real part has to be a constant, a real constant. However, it's also an L1, so it is also identically zero. So this Hopf differential is actually identically zero, fine. So that tells you this is always equal to this, and this is always zero, so it's right angle. So U, capital U, is a conformal map. And this is just saying it's a harmonic function with, uh, which is conformal, hence it's a minimal surface which you get. Now as a next step, yes, as a next step, but there could be lots of minimal surfaces inside the unit ball. Of course they are very funny ones, but they have to meet the boundary in a certain specific way. They have to respect, of course, this boundary condition here. Yeah? And when v is equal to zero, this is something which I first referred as a free minimal disk, which was studied by Fraser and Schoen. And they classified that this can only be a plain disk. And then you are in the situation that the boundary is a great circle. And then you are in good shape to get, to get your classification theorem. However, their proof I could not see how to make it really work in the case when v is not equal to zero because you have a m more complicated boundary condition, okay? But I, I show you an argument which sort of includes the Fraser and Schoen uh, result by considering the following thing. So what you learn from that first step, that's a conformal map. You also learn that you can rewrite the boundary equation, now I'll write little u here, in a very interesting way. Uh, people from harmonic maps know such a thing uh, uh, that you would maybe expect here a square, but this is not true in the fractional case. It's, it's not a square, it's a one. And there's a deeper reason for that because if you test this equa equation against u, then this term of course drops out and u times u scalar-wise is one. So you get this. Okay. Okay, what is this geometrically? The right-hand side corresponds to the length of the curve. And this 
if you use the harmonic extension, the lift corresponds to the area you span. Okay? And you will see that it will actually satisfy an isoparametric inequality. Uh, sat uh, saturate an isoparametric, it has satisfies of course the isoparametric inequality, otherwise it would be bad, uh, uh, saturates and from that you could also conclude that you have to have plane disks, but you don't know yet what the value of the left hand side is, but this is just as a side remark. So the next step is, and this is then the little innovation maybe, is to consider another Hopf differential, differential Well, what is that? You take now this. Okay, fine. You can now, I, I leave the details because this is maybe too much on the blackboard. Write down what that is. Again, it's a holomorphic function. You consider, uh, cons study what's on the boundary. You want to may maybe run a trick like that, but of course you have to work a little bit harder. But using this formulation of the Euler-Lagrange equation, you also see that this is a holomorphic function which is identically zero. But that's too much. A minimal surface which of course satisfies the first thing, there are lots of them, however it also has to satisfy this. Okay, And then you can use what's called the Weierstrass Ennepa representation of a minimal surface. Just want to say these things here, so that you can deduce, I um, always want to get things right, f half. So what's that? So it means that you can, this is a classical thing, parameterize the Wirtinger derivative of this u in terms of a holomorphic function f and a meromorphic function which satisfies certain uh, uh, compatibility condition. But if you plug this into this equation, you work a little bit, you will see ultimately that u, the image of u, can only lie in a fixed plane in R3. Okay, so, so what you get from that, finally, I leave out the details of course, that a the image lies in the plane in R3. So it's a flat, a really flat minimal surface. So it's a disk. So you will ultimately see that this is a disk. Huh? And of course, the boundary of the disk is a circle on the sphere. Now you can undo this transformation, of course, and go back to this case, where it's the unboosted case. Okay. And then you're almost done because now you can invoke some complex analysis. Because in the unboosted case, say you transform it like this, that it's in the xy plane, then you will see with this analysis that f and g have to be, say, the real and the imaginary part of a complex function, f. Ig on the upper half complex plane with complex values. And because u lies on the unit sphere, the modulus squared of f is 1 on the boundary. Huh? So that's a very special holomorphic function on the upper half plane, such that the modulus is 1 identically on the boundary. And there's a classification for that in terms of Blaschke products. And because also f is in h dot 1, it's not hardy, it's a Sobolev space here. Yeah. You can conclude that this is actually a finite Blaschke product, which I wrote down. So they only have finitely many factors. Otherwise, you would have infinite energy, which is a bit formal. Okay. product. Hence you get the complete classification I wrote to you. And I finally should say that uh, the last idea of using these Blaschke products for this kind of problem 
is also something that already Mironescu and Pisante used for something which is related where you look for what's called maybe a half harmonic map from S1 into S1. Okay, I should pay also credit to this worker somewhat. Okay, so what I want to say is now, uh, okay, if you work out these real imagining parts of these finite Blaschke products, it's just kind of rational functions you have, so it's very explicit. Uh, you can now study stability or instability, you have very explicit uh, 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 formulas for your solitary waves, okay? And this is also the point I like to end because it's freaking warm here. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> it's, it's on time. We do have time for questions. <laughs> so, uh, so I, the question I, I was asking before, so can, can there be other stationary solution except these equatorial ones? Oh no, this is, what I pr this is a byproduct of the proof. So if you have a stationary solution, my terminology is V is equal to zero, and it has, should have finite energy. Yeah, Other oh. Okay, uh, modular rotations on the sphere, of course. But right. they but all have to be... But they are all equatorial, okay. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, yes, yeah. they are all, all, yes. This is a, yeah, yeah, that's a byproduct, actually. So and, and I should maybe say about A... I thought you were looking for things of a special form, right? That's why I would, I'm asking the question. With B on the, on the last component. Yeah, but I can, okay, what I show finally is that I'm uh, allowed to do this because they're always equatorial disks. So I can always rotate it that the last is identically zero. Okay. And I should say A is, is a funny proof. Uh, you test the equation against the Hilbert transform of U and do some magic. Huh? In, the, in the L2 critical half wave case, we cannot actually rule out solitary waves which have speed more than one. <laughs> We don't know how to do this. In this model, it's a, it's a magic thing to really get the sharp limit for the V. Do you have two questions? Um, so, uh, maybe if I can understand. Uh, yes. Okay, now you have done the job. Okay, let's. Oh, <laughs> okay, I go, go home. To the <laughs> next question. Yeah. Stability yes. uh, and just the existence of the flow, by the way. Right? Yes, I have no, not talked about the existence of the flow. Yes, of course, yeah. That's, uh, that's a lot of things to do. Yes. So. Yes, but at the formal level, stability? Stability, I would expect stability. When, 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 when in your project, when you are just one? Well, I would expect that, but um, also because uh, formally, you see, if you think of the Schrödinger map blow up, you have an unstable one uh, because you have a slow decay of uh, a resonance. I mean, you have a slow decay in the linearization, a zero mode, which has very slow decay. Yes. And I think here it does not happen that you have. I don't. I, I don't think so. But I would not okay. bet much money. I have to look into after the euro. <laughs> look into the things more closely. Or after Germany gets an email. Yeah, maybe. Yes, maybe next week I have time. <laughs> okay. More questions, please. So, what is your momentum function? Ah, yeah, that is a, a good question. It's a bit like this. I draw a picture. So the momentum of a configuration U, a closed curve, is the uh, solid angle that this curve, so to say, in the unit sphere uh, gives you. But this is, of course, not well defined up to four pi's because you have ambiguities. So, um, so in the physics literature, um, there is a kind of a uh, dispute about what is whether there is a true momentum or not for such a model, but you have a, f you have a conserved quantity modulo a value of 4 pi. You could consider an exponential of that. But it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny functional. The momentum is, is, is really not that straightforward, say, for these models. Of course, also, you might wonder whether the traveling solitary waves you get are also existing in the discrete models, and this is always a delicate question for NLS. There are might some traveling waves in the discrete lattice model or not and so on and here it's also not so clear what survives or what gets created by this continuum limit. Sorry, I was going off the tangent. Yes? There's, there's so much structure, it's actually very beautiful, there's a lot of structure. 
And it does come from a, not just one integrable system, but a class yeah. integrable system. Yes. So what would you s s speculate? I would speculate it's not completely integrable, but I don't know. I mean, I try to, to cook up legs pairs, but uh, it's not my prime education, so uh, it takes some time. Maybe, uh, but I don't know. Maybe there is. Th maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you you see really uh, serious uh, blow up. Yeah, I don't know. No. Yeah, uh, yeah. That maybe in some weird way. You see, like for the Chego equation, you might have infinitely many conservation laws uh, in evolution up to a certain kind of regularity. In, in in higher regularity, you might as have at as least grow up. For infinite, I mean, some small kind of infinite type blow up or something like that. I don't know. But okay. conservation laws needn't be uh, needn't be coercive. So, for example, Boussinesque is nicely integral, but solutions just don't exist. Okay. Okay. There's no okay. incompatibility between. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You will teach me more than I know. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It depends on how you define this. I don't know. We should wait for. Okay, so if no more questions, let's deliver our speaker.